The Capitalist Unconscious by or Marx and Lacan by Samuel Tomsek. This is part three of chapter one. Chapter one is called The Unconscious is Politics from Saussure to Marx. And part three is called Representation and Production. Before 1968, Marx is not a major reference in Lacan's teaching. His name appears only sporadically and mainly in relation to the subject of the signifier. All this changes in the seminar following the May 68 events in which Lacan elaborates the homology between the object of capital and the object of psychoanalysis. The title of the corresponding seminar resumes the underlying orientation of Lacan's second return to Freud, d'un autre, autre à l'autre, from the big other, the field of language and the absolute autonomy of the signifier, to the small other, object A, the object of jouissance, but also the object that is logically associated with surplus value. As the seminar title already indicates, the accent is displaced from representation to production, introducing another level of the theory of the signifier. The emphasis on representation only approaches the signifier through the transcendentalism of the symbolic, where the signifier seems to be separated from jouissance and to entail its prohibition. Subsequent orientation progressively abolishes this position and moves toward a conception of the signifier that is not simply invested with jouissance, but becomes its privileged cause and apparatus. However, the causal relation presupposes a specific labor within language. Lacan thereby returns to the revolutionary kernel of Freud's theories, his labor theory of the unconscious, which explains the satisfaction of the unconscious tendency by the consumption of psychic energy, labor power, and the mental process. The move from the other of, lang of language to the other of jouissance overlaps with the shift from Saussure, the privileged theoretician of representation, to Marx, the key theoretician of production. The linguistic other is now envisaged through the parallax of the subjective lack and the objective surplus, the two faces of discursive production. It is more than indicative that from this point on Lacan will repeat the well-known slogan, the other does not exist. The claim should not be taken too lightly, notably not in the sense of vulgar atheism, which declares God an illusion that the progress of science necessarily abolishes. Lacan chooses a more sobering direction. Not only was the postmodern marked by an increase in religious belief from institutionalized religions to various new age obscurantisms, but the logic of capital too successfully imposes its, religion, its religious component that marks in visage through the notion of fetishism. Lacan's prognosis of a triumph of religion over revolutionary science and emancipatory politics meanwhile became reality. The other does not exist also contains a materialist lesson which links an existence of the other and causality of the signifier while distinguishing the linguistic other, language discourse, from the theological and metaphysical god, the other of the other, while in existence disclosure and completeness does not prevent the other from having real consequences. The persistence of religion consists in the, in the idealist counter-offensive, which strives to attribute the consequences in question to a positive being. As long as things are said, the God hypothesis will persist. In the context of fetishism, this means that the inexistence of the market, the global market as an instable and antagonistic space of values, goes hand in hand with the hypothesis of the vital forces of capitalist abstractions. It is no coincidence that Lacan speaks of the triumph of religion at the dawn of financialization, only a couple of years after the American abolition of the Bretton Woods system that terminated the gold standard and, and inaugurated the era of free floating currencies. The triumph of religion has a concrete name in political economy, neoliberalism with its wild hypothesis that the deregulation of capital liberates its creative potentials and imminent teleology, the spontaneous tendency of the market towards equilibrium. In its theory of the other, psychoanalysis cannot but assume the position of atheism and materialism. 
The move to the small other extends this positioning in a logical alliance with the critique of political economy. I will proceed with a homolog homological outlook based on Marx in order to introduce today the place where we need to situate the essential function of object A. The choice of terms contains an implicit criticism of Freudo Marxism for remaining in a metaphorical or an analogical framework without exhaustively thematizing the logical, epistemological, and finally political continuity of Marx's critique of economic discourse and Freud's elaboration of libidinal economy. The thesis is that the unconscious production of jouissance and the social production of value follow the same logic and display the same structural contradictions, tensions, and deadlocks, not repression of productive potentials of sexuality, drives, and desires, but the insatiable demand for production, production for the sake of production, from which the repressed unconscious tendencies cannot be accepted. The homo homology in question is supposed to situate the object of psychoanalysis, now translated as, surpl now translated as surplus jouissance in the discursive structure. This translation is coined according to Marx's surplus value, Merwert, and Lacan even proposes a German term, Merlust. The coupling of jouissance and surplus, however, is not Lacan's invention, but is already present in Freud, who in his book on jokes centered his analysis of unconscious satisfaction on what he called Lustgewinn, pleasure gain. Freud thus already used the notion of the surplus object, but did not situate it logically and topologically. Subsequent development in psychoanalysis abolished the revolutionary consequences of the Freudian insight, so that Lacan's intervention aims at the same critical status as Marx with regard to the political economic debates regarding surplus value. This object A, in a certain sense, I invented it, just as one can say that Marx's discourse invented something. What does this mean? Marx's discovery is surplus value. It is not that object A was not approached before my discourse, of course, but it was approached in an insufficient way, as insufficient as the definition of surplus value was before Marx's discourse made it appear in all its rigor. Inventions and not discoveries then, and what is invented is not objects, which were already known before Marx and Lacan, but a method that exposes the hidden logic of their production. Here we again come across the inseparability of materialism and logic, as both inventions contain a turn in the upstanding of discourse, or in the understanding of discourse. At the root of this logical and materialist orientation stand the aforementioned quarrel regarding discursive consequences and the notion of material cause, now associated with the signifier. Lacan leaves no doubt that, this, that his concern is solely the logical and not the analogical relation between Marx and Freud. To say homology means that the relation is not analogical. It is the same thing and the same stuff as far as it is the discursive scissor cut, trait de ciseau du discours. The French phrasing alludes directly to the first chapter of Capital where the commodity exchange and the double character of labor are repeatedly exemplified throughout tailoring or through tailoring. What matters is the inversion of the relation between concrete labor and abstract labor, since only through this inversion can the place and the function of surplus value in the capitalist mode of production be unveiled. One of Marx's corrections of political economy resides in acknowledging the structural function of the gap between abstract and concrete labor, which depends on the double character of commodity. Through the social implementation of the commodity form, the absolute autonomy of exchange introduces a set of consequences in the subjective and the social reality. No cut is merely concrete labor, rather it is part of a broader discursive logic that supports the capitalist organization of labor. The action contains the central abstraction next to capital, the commodity producing commodity that is bought and sold on the market. In this way, every concrete labor is stamped by the contradiction that leads back to the double character of commodity. But let us here take a few steps back. 
without any logical gap that would separate the object of psychoanalysis from the object, object of the Marxist critique, both endeavors are joined by material implication. Only my theory of language as, stru as structure of the unconscious can be said to be implied by Marxism, if, that is, you are not more demanding than the material implication. That is, that, that my theory of language is true, whatever the adequacy of Marxism, and that it is needed by it, whatever be the defect that it leaves Marxism with. So much for the theory of language implied logically by Marxism. A material implication is false, only when truth implies something false. Then there are only a few options left. Either Marx's theory is true, which implies Lacan's theory of language is something true, or Marx's theory is false, which nevertheless implies that Lacan's theory of language is true. Or, finally, both, of Mar both Marx's and Lacan's theories are false. But even in this case, the homology remains valid and the material implication conserves its truth value. In any case, the critique of political economy precedes and conditions psychoanalysis, not merely historically, but above all logically, epistemologically, and politically. To say Marxism naturally does not mean the same as to say Marx. To say Marxism naturally does not mean the same as to say Marx. The quote contains more than it seems, for Lacan later alludes to the theory of language that Marxism implied historically. In the background stands Stalin's intervention into the Soviet linguistic debates in which he negated the scientific status of, of Marism. The theories of the Soviet linguist Nikolai Yakovlevich Mar, who defined language as a superstructure. Mar's theory implied that every major change in the base should lead to a major change in the superstructure. This would then mean that the Soviet Revolution should have introduced a new language or produced radical changes in the actually existing multiplicity of languages in the Soviet Union. Empirically, this was naturally false and practically impossible. The development of language takes place independently from social revolutions, and Stalin's intervention into the debate consisted in declaring Marx's theory of language anti-Marxist, ending the debate with the order that language is not a superstructure. Saussure so claimed something simil similar in his lectures. The impossibility of a linguistic revolution comes from the fact that each subject participates in language individually. This individual participation prevents social revolutions from introducing major changes into the functioning of language. However, for Saussure, the same individual participation implies that language is subject to constant change. To repeat, Language is not a state, but a movement. It cannot be revolutionized, but there is nevertheless a permanent revolution, or better, a constant development and non-teleological becoming in language. This permanent revolution is located opposite individual participation and does not mean that it is the subjects who consciously or intentionally change language. Lacan additionally specifies the characteristics of his theory of language. The least you can accord me concerning my theory of language is, should it interest you, that it is materialist. The signifier is matter transcending itself into language. The critical value of this materialism is contained in the description of the signifier as matter transcending itself into language. An unusual matter, of course, since it violates the spontaneous understanding of materiality. But then again, the modern scientific understanding of matter is consistently counterintuitive and counter-empirical. The signifier and consequently language as such appears as transcendence with, within imminence, torsion within materiality. The causality of the signifier then does not consist in the simple scenario where the signifier intervenes from some presupposed outside, but in the act of self-transcending through which an autonomous system of differences emerges from materiality. Lacan thereby rejects two seemingly opposite but nonetheless anti-materialist readings. Conventionalism, for which language is a cultural product, human convention with the exclusive aim of communication, and neuro neural linguistics, which places language in the broader context of cerebral evolution, and for which language is no less an organ of communication, Neither a convention nor a biological product of evolution, since both reductions exclude the autonomy of the signifier, 
a contingent but no less real consequence that accompanies the emergence of language and without which language is unthinkable. This autonomy denaturalizes the apparently natural or conventional tool of cerebral or cultural evolution. Language is therefore an internal exteriority, a foreign body in the biological body. Its atom, the signifier, becomes a cause by loosening its ties both to cerebral materiality and to communication. At this point, the relation between use value and exchange value re-enters the picture, and Lacan's materialist definition of the signifier echo echoes Marx's description of commodity as a sinlik, uber sinlik ding, sensual, suprasensual thing, where the same act of transcendent trans the same act of transcendence, articulation of materiality, commodities into commodity language, is at stake. And just as the transcendence of the signifier produces a metonymic subject and an ungraspable object of jouissance, the transcendence of commodities transforms labor into labor power and situates surplus value as the privileged object cause in the capitalist social link. The materialist definition of the signifier pursues the quarrel regarding alienation. An idealist would necessarily claim that the subject is cons constitutively unalienated and that alienation is secondary. At the same time, as soon as one starts from the primacy of the signifier, alienation turns out to be constitutive of the subject. The articulation of the signifier into an open system of differences can only produce a decentralized subjectivity. And Marx's critical move in the first chapter of Capital consists in differentiating constituted alienation, fetishism, which still concerns the cognitive misperception of commodities from constitutive alienation, production of capitalist subjectivity qua labor power. Labor power designates the capitalist appropriation of the subject of the signifier, its transformation in accordance with the commodity form, in other words, Value represents what of labor is contained in each object that carries value, but it can only represent it in commodity exchange, that is, for another value. But labor power is simply the subject. It is Marx's name for the subject. According to Marx, his materialist predecessors, notably Feuerbach, failed to theorize the logical connection between alienation and structure. It is not materialist enough to simply reverse the relations between God and man or to proclaim that God is a projection of man's desires, something that Freud formulated in his critique of religion. Marx founded materialism on the detachment of alienation from imaginary projection, associating, associating it instead with structure and logics. The paradigmatic example here being the equivocity of commodity language in human language. The materialist orientation consequently sub substituted the reference to man and to its transcendental essence with the reference to the subject, understood not as an autonomous consciousness, but as a real consequence of the autonomous signifier. This is the essential point of Marx's thesis on Feuerbach, which is actualized in Capital. The chief defect of all hitherto existing materialism that a Feuerbach included is that the thing, reality, sensuousness is conceived only in the form of the object or of contemplation but not as sensuous human activity, practice, not subjectivity or subjectively. Hence, in contradistinction to materialism, the active side was developed abstractly by idealism, which of course does not know real sensuous activity as such. Farbach resolves the religious essence into the human essence, but the human essence is no abstraction inherent in each single individual. In its reality, it is the ensemble of the social relations. Pre-critical theories of the subject continue to use the idealist vocabulary of cognition, contemplation, consciousness, keeping as their ultimate reference transcendental, transcendental and centralized subjectivity, while the critique of political economy departs from the repressed flip side of this idealist subject, the alienated subject at work in every discursive action. This is the logical subject of politics. In order to achieve this, discourse, too, needs to be envisaged as more than mere organon. The aim of Marx's analysis of labor, therefore, cannot be the simple liberation of living labor from blood-sucking capital, but a rigorous determination of the actual subject of capitalism, labor power,
this abolition would initiate a structural transformation of the entire mode of production and a transformation of the subject, since the logical subject of the autonomous system of differences would thereby be separated from the commodified form imposed by capitalism. Marx did envisage a liberation of the subject, not from alienation, as the humanist Marxists continue to claim, but from the false universalism of commodity form and from its abstract representation in the regime of values. Political economy in the capitalist vision of politics that is grounded on its concepts sees in the subject a mere commodity, hence an object, while enthroning the tendencies of capital and the private interests of the capitalist class as the privileged subject of politics. Milner proposed to call the materialist orientation that Lacan elaborated in his reference to Marx discursive materialism. The expression risks falsely suggesting that Lacan was attempting to, to construct some sort of postmodern materialism, a combination of vulgar materialism and the linguistic performative. Yet it all comes down to how we understand Lacan's claim that discourse has consequences. If we interpret them within the framework of performative theory, then they remain within the symbolic, confirm the autonomy of the signifier, and address merely the permanent modification of linguistically constructed reality. Lacan's recurrent appeal to formal logic and mathematics goes beyond these narrow frameworks of performativism and exposes another kind of production in language, from the mere proliferation of language games and metonomic meaning. The issue is most evidently at stake when it comes to the subject of representation, labor power the subject of the unconscious, and the object of production, surplus value, surplus jouissance. They are not simply performative effects of the capitalist discourse, but real consequences of the structural causality in social reality in the living body. Lacan often uses the example of the moon landing in his attempts to theorize discursive consequences. This event was not so much a giant leap for mankind, but rather an event in perfect accordance with what Foucault described as the death of man. The true event is not the actual moon landing, but the fact that it lies within the realm of discursive possibilities alone. Scientific discourse was able to bring about the moon landing, where thought becomes witness to an eruption of the real, and with mathematics, using nothing other than a linguistic apparatus. The moon landing is thus a discursively generated event, which does not make it any less or any way less real only that the materiality of the real demonstrated by the moon landing as an event that has its mathematical foundations goes much further than the reality of the moon landing, the empirical presence of man on the moon. The appearance, the appearance of the moon landing being an achievement of man conceals the capacity of scientific discourse to produce an event by means of the linguistic apparatus, without man as its central agent, but not without a subject as its effect. Behind the giant leap from mankind, there lies the final erasure of the idealist human essence. The event once again demonstrated man's actual status in the capitalist universe as a quantifiable subject, labor power, mobilized by a successful cooperation between science and capitalism, meaning that man was again confirmed in his status of waste material rather than a sublime generic essence. When Lacan points out the discrepancy between the historical and the logical deployments of the Marxist theory of language, he indicates that Marxism failed to recognize that Marx's idea of commodity language and the inversion of the relation between use value and exchange value, exchange as an abstract but nonetheless productive action, already made it further than the Saussurian determination of the double character of linguistic signs. Lacan's correction a structural linguistics, the isolation of the signifier from the sign and the introduction of the subject, provides the materialist theory of language indicated in Marx's critique. In the earlier quoted excerpts, Lacan writes twice, my theory of language. In turn, Marx's theory makes the same correction in relation to the political economic labor theory of value. A critical and materialist theory of value can be elaborated only under the condition that the abstract political economic subject of private interest is replaced with the alienated subject qua labor power. 
In this case as well, Marxism regressed back to the idealist framework that Marx criticized in his theses on Feuerbach. The Marxist variant of idealist subjectivity is proletarian class consciousness, yet another version of the transcendental subject of history. A significant part of Marxism, one but surely not the only exception, being Althusser's theoretical anti-humanism, inverted Marx's logic, which begins with the autonomy of value in order to arrive at the production of decentralized subjectivity. That capital is about structural and not empirical or cognitive reality is made explicit in the very preface, where Marx writes, To prevent possible misunderstanding, let me say this. I do not by any means depict the capitalist and the landowner in rosy colors, but individuals are dealt with here only in so far as they are the per personifications of economic categories, the bearers of particular class relations and interests. My standpoint from which the development of the economic formation of society is viewed as a process of natural history can less than any other make the individual responsible for relations whose creature he remains, socially speaking, however much he may subjectively raise himself above them. Again, Marx does not aim to ground politics on the cognition of the capitalist relations of production, whose efficiency is independent from consciousness, but on a materialist theory of the subject, which is supposed to give ground to an actual universalism, while also demonstrating the root at which the false universality of commodity form, commodity form grabs each individual and society as a whole. The rejection of the primacy of cognition is further expressed in the following well-known reversal, where Marx's implicit understanding of the signifier already surpasses Saussure. Men do not therefore bring the products of their labor into relation with each other as values, because they see these objects merely as the material integuments of homogeneous human labor. The reverse is true. By equating their different products to each other in exchange as values, they equate their different kinds of labor as human labor. They do not know it, nevertheless, they do it. Value, therefore, does not have its description branded on its forehead. It rather transforms every product into a social hieroglyphic. Later on, men try to decipher the hieroglyphic to get behind the secret of their own social product. For the characteristic which, which objects of utility have of being values, is as much men's social product as is their language. Because there is exchange, different kinds of labor are condensed into an abstraction, which is nonetheless material. The system of differences transforms labor, which does not leave the subject unaffected. Hence, the question is not in deciphering the hidden meaning of social hieroglyphs, but in situating the subject they signal in their autonomy. For whether in civilization or in the desert, a hieroglyph always implies another hieroglyph and the subject of, of the relation independently of consciousness. A hieroglyph is always already social because of this implication and not because of its use by concrete and conscious individuals. When it comes to social hieroglyphs, fetishism is already an attempt at their interpretation, which leaves the structure of the commodity universe unknown and the logic of production mystified. By ascribing to commodities, money, cap and capital, the value of having a positive and intrinsic quality, fetishization comes rather close to hermeneutic interpretation, just as for Plato and Heidegger, being was an imminent feature of language and not its effect. On the contrary, a materialist interpretation highlights the autonomy of structural relations and traces the fetishist interpretation back to the Equiv equivocity of commodity form. Slavoj, Slavoj Žižek has suggested on several occasions that they do not know it, never, nevertheless they do it, should be supplemented with they know it, nevertheless they do it. The efficiency of structural relations being immune to consciousness, Marx's critical method cannot envisage an overall abolition of fetishization but the detachment of politics from the reign of economic abstractions, which has been intensified by decades of neoliberalism. The liberation of politics consequently means the same as the abolition of the rootedness of social links in the commodity form as their unique formal envelope. 
The statement, they do not know it, nevertheless they do it, seems to contain the division between conscious knowledge and unconscious action. But the actual and more fundamental division exists in the regime of knowledge, between reflected knowledge on the one hand and unknown, uh, and unknown knowledge contained in both thinking and action on the other. Marx is here even more Freud's pre predecessor, showing that the necessary precondition for, ab for abolishing the political reign of capitalist abstractions resides in a systematic reintroduction of negativity into politics. Class struggle is not the sole politically charged signifier. The unconscious is one as well. To demonstrate the logical inscription of the unconscious into politics was the central effort of Lacan's homology. When introducing the homology between both surpluses, Lacan expresses his regret that he did not introduce Marx earlier into the field in which he is, after all, entirely at home. Or on another occasion, Merwert is Marx lust, Marx's surplus jouissance. As evident as this affinity may appear in the late 1960s, this introduction could not have happened before the invention of object A. In 1968, the object A is already the central Lacanian concept, and Marx can now become the privileged reference, which helps to uncover the place where we need to situate the essential function of, ob of object A. The homology immediately extends into hom homotopy. The logical identity of both surpluses strives to situate the specific mode of existence of the unconscious in the social link while also accounting for the unconscious effects of the capitalist discourse. The capitalist colonization of the mental apparatus. In homology, there is no place for the opposition of the subjective and the social. Freud already tried to place psychoanalysis on this border, and Lacan's notion of discourse pursues this direction, describing both the structure articulated in individual speech and the structure of the social link. But Lacan differs from Freud in one important respect. While Freud's theories amounted to the myth of the primordial father, the originary subject of jouissance, the fundamental Lacanian lesson is that there is no such thing as a subject of jouissance. Just as for Marx, there is no subject of surplus value, unless one fetishizes the appearance of capital as the vital subject of valorization, as is the case in the developed forms of capitalist abstractions such as financial capital but also on the more immediate level of commodities and money. Lacan introduces his reading of Marx by recalling the most evident feature of his critical break with political economy. Marx departs from the function of the market. His novelty is the place where he situates labor. It is not that labor is something new, but that it is bought, that there is a market of labor. This is what allows Marx to demonstrate what is inaugural in his discourse and what is called surplus value. The departure is not the market of political economists where all commodities and values seem to occupy the same level and are abolished in equivalence, but a market of labor where labor power is the negative metonymic constant that value represents in every commodity and that exposes the paradoxes of commodity form and of the market as such. To repeat, the main inconsistency resides in the double character of commodity, which grounds the difference between commodities and commodity producing commodity. And more generally, the gap between representation of labor power in terms of exchange value and production of surplus value in the consumption of labor power. The political economists see the market as an immense collection of commodities, a closed system whose dynamic does not necessarily contradict the imminent tendencies to self-regulation and homeostasis. The market appears homogeneous and structured on stable and, predict and predictable relations. Similarly, as in the previously discussed Saussurian analogy, in which there are only values that relate to commodities in an arbitrary, but nevertheless stable and adequate way. In the sharpest possible contrast to this idyllic scenario, scenario the consequent interpretation of the market as being first and foremost a market of labor exposes that this political economic other is traversed by contradictions and is therefore inconsistent. At the very heart of the capitalist transformation of labor 
stands the strikingly banal and yet wide-reaching fact that Libra is bought and sold on the market, where it appears as a commodity among others. To say that Marx's novelty lies in the correct situation of labor, and not simply in the labor theory of value, to which his critical interventions can mistakenly be reduced, again argues that a materialist science of value is not possible without a theory of the subject that the political economic labor theory failed to articulate. Lacan grounds the homology between surplus value and surplus jouissance on a reformulation of his definition of the signifier. The signifier is what represents a subject to another signifier. Saying that Marx's version would be value represents labor power for another value would not be entirely correct because it would bypass the double character of the commodity form. Lacan therefore draws a different conclusion. His old definition is copied from the fact that in what Marx deciphered, namely the economic reality, the subject of exchange value is represented next to the use value. The extension of the double character of commodity to the logic of the signifier additionally exposes the ambiguous status of use value, whose abstract face becomes apparent in the consumption of labor power. Its usefulness indeed consists in the production of other commodities, but from the perspective of capital, its consumption aims at the extraction of surplus value. The gap between representation and production cannot be localized because it is everywhere and nowhere in the labor process. No quantification can draw a limit where the production of use values ceases and the production of surplus value begins and correspondingly where labor is paid and where unpaid surplus labor begins. The problem clearly does not lie in the fact that the value of labor power would be inadequate, but that a more accurate representation of labor power should be sought, but that labor power is already produced as structurally inadequate and non-identical. Consequently, the articulation of representation with production, exchange value with use value, presupposes a different topology from the univocal division of inside and outside. The space in which representation and production intertwine is simultaneously continuous and discontinuous, displaying the main feature of the Mobius strip. This is the hom homotopy, homotopy that the homology leads to. Oops. The crucial factor that complicates the topological but also the temporal relations is the tendency of capital towards self-valorization, which makes the production of use values indistinguishable from the production of surplus value. Marx writes, the capitalist has bought the labor power at its daily value. The use value of the labor power belongs to him throughout one working day. He has thus acquired the right to make the worker work for him during one day. But what is a working day? At all events, it is less than a natural day. How much less? The capitalist has his own views of this point of no return, the necessary limit of the working day. As a capitalist, he is only capital personified. His soul is the soul of capital, but capital has one sole driving force, the drive to valorize itself, to create surplus value, to make its constant part, the means of production, absorb the greatest possible amount of surplus labor. The structural tendencies and imperatives of capital push the entirety of production towards purposeless and compulsive automat automatism. Through this autom automaton, the main feature of jouissance emerges in the capitalist organization of labor, the fact that the surplus object serves no purpose. It does not satisfy another tendency except the drive for self-valorization, so that the ultimate aim of labor consists in producing more labor. Lacan's translation of the signifier into economic reality recapitulates the contradiction of the two circulations that Marx formalizes in the introductory chapters of Capital. The structure of the capitalist mode of production is internally doubled on the circulation commodity, money, commodity, or CMC, and money, commodity, money, or MCM. This internal doubling is not without the appearance that we are dealing with two different and independent circulations, which can be read historically or logically and Marx seems to propose both readings. According to the historic one, the CMC circulation 
exchange, selling, and buying would be the oldest form that historically and logically precedes capitalism, and that, more importantly, does not contain the perversion that grounds the capitalist mode of production, whose aim is exclusively the production of surplus value, the constant growth of profit and absolute autonomy of capital, MM, the formula of fictitious capital that abolishes the mediation of production through a commodity labor power. The genesis of capitalism thus implies a structural shift that is both, that is both historical and logical, and the difference between the first and the second circulation seems to recapitulate the historical passage from feudalism to capitalism. Marx formalizes this development in the circulation, MCM, which he immediately corrects into MCM, where M equals M plus M, increase of value, and thereby finally situates surplus value in the social link. Lacan's definition of the signifier can be situated in both circulations, but has entirely different consequences in the virtually infinite circulation, MCM. The historical reading of the first circulation inevitably falls into the trap of its idealization, the nostalgia for those good old days when commodity exchange was still immediate and when social reality was not corrupted by the merciless drive for profit. Placing CMC before the circulation of capital thus produces a fantasy of economic exchange as the paradigmatic case of social relation and the illusion that this exchange was once homeostatic and regulated, by, and regulated, but was thrown out of joint by the instabilities of capital, an illusion of the past in which money still fulfilled its social function, its use value, which consisted in supporting economic exchange and thereby the social relation. Marx certainly does not promote this oversimplifying nostalgic vision, since he recalls that the paradoxes of the general equivalent already troubled Aristotle. At the same time, both circulations address the inner inconsistency of the capitalist social link. Their logical reading shows that Marx, in fact, analyzes the gap between appearance and structure. CMC is not more immediate, not an authentic exchange that is later corrupted by profit-oriented, MCM, but an inner fiction of the circulation, MCM. Of course, we cannot simply claim that in capitalism, commodity exchange is inoperative. It is operative precisely as far as it masks the circulation of capital and neutralizes its immediate obscenity and exploitative tendencies. According to the logical reading, the first circulation, selling and buying, concerns the worker, and the second, apparently symmetrical one, buying and selling, the capitalist. Of course, the whole critical point of Marx's formalization is to prove that both circulations are asymmetrical, that what the worker is selling is not the same thing as what the capitalist is buying, or put differently, that the value for which the labor is sold is not the same as the value for which it is bought. When the capitalist buys labor power, he gets in one and the same package surplus value. We pay labor with money because we are on the market. We pay it according to its true price as it is defined on the market by the function of exchange value. But there is unpaid value in what appears as the fruit of labor because the true price of this fruit is in its use value. This unpaid labor, which is nevertheless paid in a just way in relation to the consistency of the market and the functioning of capitalist discourse is surplus value. The apparently banal remark that we pay labor with money demonstrates its point if we remember the most basic Marxian lesson regarding money. Since we are dealing with two different circulations, money, just like any other commodity, appears in its double character, once as use value, a material support of exchange, a concrete embodiment of that sameness that is expressed by all exchanged commodities, and once as capital, the embodiment of the autonomy of exchange value and of the surplus object. Money finally reveals the phantasmatic status of use value, which is nevertheless necessary for the functioning of the capitalist machinery. Money has no use value except that it supports exchange, it embodies the autonomy of value. For this reason, it becomes the fetishist object par excellence. But social inequality again reveals the imminent doubling of exchange. 
since the laborer only deals with money as means of exchange, that is, labor power can only be represented through exchange value, and according to the law of exchange, the laborer receives a just payment. The capitalist, however, deals with money as capital, and from this perspective, the use value of labor power does not consist in producing commodities, but in producing more value. For this reason, the capitalist, as the personification of capital and as a social administrator of its private interest, tends to extend the working day and to reduce the time needed for the production of use values. The laborer gets paid justly, yet the truth of labor is not in the presumed, in presumed adequacy of representation, but in the structural gap that both separates and links it to production.